Production and Growth. This chapter covers a very important topic, one that many of you will find compelling. It's not really one of our more challenging chapters. It has a lot of material, but it's not really challenging conceptually. A lot of concepts. A typical family with all their possessions in the UK, which is an advanced economy. There's a lot of things in the picture here. GDP per capita in the UK is around $36,000. Child mortality rate, 0.5%, very low. High school enrollment is 98%. This and the next two slides are from the FYI box entitled, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Statistics. These photos put a human face on the statistics and theories covered in this chapter. Many of you may connect these pictures uh, more than you will in, say, the data that you find in the reading in Table 1. So it's kind of easy to see a picture and get a better idea of what people have. So for each picture, the family was paid to drag all of its stuff outside for the photo. Now, uh, let this picture so soak in for a moment. There's some lovely things for the fam that this family has. There's a sailboat. The house has two chimneys, two bay windows in front, and a state-of-art state washer and dryer, and so on, so on and so forth. they got a lot of things out there. Now, for the data sources, you can see your textbook here. The child mortality rate is the percentage of children that die before reaching five years of age. Again, very, very low in the UK. The high school enrollment rate is the percentage of high school age children in school. So most of their high school age children are in school. All good signs. Now, take a good look at this photo. This is a typical family with all of their possessions in Mexico, a middle income country. Okay. A little less stuff than we had in England, but still a, a good bit of stuff. GDP per capita, 15390 Child mortality rate's a little higher, 1.6%. And high school enrollment is only 71% compared to 98% in the UK. This family seems comfortable, but they don't quite have as much stuff as the British family did. There's no sailboat. There's no house with bay windows. Indeed, an income of 15000 seems incredibly low by the standards by which most American college students are accustomed. But this family is not doing so bad and this income is actually not that bad for the standards of living for the rest of the world. Again the data is available in the textbook. Now let's take a look at a typical family with all their possessions in Mali, a very poor country. Here the photo really is worth a thousand words. Look at the family's possessions. There's pottery, a few sticks, some clothing, and a dwelling that does not appear to have running water or climate control. That's it. No sailboat, no upholstered furniture, no modern appliances. This family is very poor. Now, GDP per capita, just a little over a thousand. Child mortality rate, again, that's the rate of, uh, the child mortality rate is the percentage of children that die before reaching the age of five years, is 17.6%. It's kind of scary. Right? That's basically two out of every ten kids. Now, high school enrollment is only 31%. Again, that's the percentage of high school age children who are actually in school. 31%. More of a bleak looking picture here. Now, let's take a look at some world development indicators as given by the World Bank. Now, GDP per capita here is um, it's the growth rate, the average annual growth rate of real GDP per capita local, given local currency. Again, per capita is per person in their local currency um, as computed in their 2012 value. Okay, So um, the first category is based on 2012 dollars. The second category is actually based on 1970 dollars is our base here. The table is similar uh, to Table 1 in the textbook, but there are two differences. The set of countries is slightly different, and the growth rates here are computed from 1970 to 2012 in the second category. Now, the purpose of this table, and thus the Table 1 in the text, is to convey the following two facts. 
There are great differences in standard of living across countries, as we saw in the photos. There are great differences in growth rates across countries as well. Now, the rankings of countries can change over time. Countries at the bottom need not remain, remain there. Witness the growth that, um, from Japan and China, who both were far poorer in 1970. They kind of shot up this list by 2012. So it's important to think about wealth, not only in terms of the uh, being in the United States, but also worldwide. So incomes and growth from around the world, um, you can see here the GDP per capita and the growth rates very greatly. There are vast differences in living standards around the world. The second fact here is that there are also great variation in the growth rates across countries, as illustrated by the table as well. So big differences in GDP per capita. Look at these differences in growth rates. Okay. Obviously, if you're growing more, that's a big thing. If you're really low and not growing at all, that's not a great thing for your, your quality of life in those countries. Now, taking a look at incomes and growth for around the world, since growth rates vary, the country rankings can change over time. Poor countries are not necessarily doomed to poverty forever. For example, Singapore incomes were low in 1960 and are quite high now. Rich countries can take their status for granted. They may be overtaken by poorer countries, poorer but faster growing countries, I should say. So you really don't want to stand pat, even if you have a, a high GDP per capita. You want to find ways to continue to grow. Now, this leads to some questions. Why are some countries richer than others? Why do some countries grow quickly while others seem stuck in the poverty trap? And what policies may help raise growth rates and, uh, and raise the overall long-run living standards? What can be done? Well, first thing we're going to look at uh, is productivity. Recall one of the ten principles of economics from Chapter 1 is that a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services, here abbreviated by GNS, goods and services. This ability depends on productivity, which is the average quantity of goods and services produced per unit of labor input. So how productive are your people? Now, again, remember Y is real GDP. It's the quantity of output produced. And L is the quantity of labor. So productivity then could be Y over L, which is real GDP, your output, divided by your labor, which gives you your output per worker. So why is productivity so important? When a nation's workers are very productive, real GDP is large and incomes are high. When productivity grows rapidly, so do living standards. What then determines productivity and its growth rate? Well, let's take a look at physical, uh, physical capital per, uh, the physical capital per worker. Recall that the stock of equipment and structures used to produce goods and services is called capital, denoted as K. In this case, we're adding physical capital. Now, you have a choice between capital and labor. Now, capital, being K, divided by labor, tells us how much capital there is per worker. If there's a lot of capital, that number's going to be bigger. If there's just a little bit of capital and there's a lot of labor, that number is going to be smaller. Productivity is higher when the average worker has more capital. For example, machines and equipment to work with. For example, an increase in capital over labor causes an increase in output over labor. So if you give labor more machines to produce things with, they're going to have more output per worker. So it's common to refer to physical capital as just capital, hence the brackets around physical. Here, though, the distinction is important on this slide because the following slides discuss human capital. The last bullet point on this slide dovetails into the FYI box on the production function, which is in this PowerPoint presentation and follows the determinants of productivity, but it's in an FYI box in the reading. So when we say in this chapter physical capital, 
we're thinking of machines and equipment. Give labor more machines and equipment, you typically give them more output per worker. Now let's talk about human capital per worker. Human capital, abbreviated as H, is the knowledge and skills workers acquire through education, like what you're doing right now, training, like might be paid for by your employer, and experience, your work experience. Now, the more human capital you have, perhaps the more productive your labors can be. So let's take a look at that. Human capital over labor is the average worker's human capital. How much does each worker, on average, have in human capital, knowledge, skills, abilities? Productivity is higher when, we're, when the average worker has more human capital, when they have more skills, when they have more education. An example would be an increase in human capital per unit of labor causes an increase in output per unit of labor. Just like more capital, physical capital, per unit of labor increased output per labor, the presence of more human capital per unit of labor, the brighter your labor force is, the more productive they are. Now, let's also take a look at natural, natural resources. And we can look at it on a per worker basis. Obviously, if a country has a lot of national, uh, natural resources, it's something it can use to be productive. Natural resources, abbreviated from here on out as N, are the inputs into the production process that nature provides. For example, land, mineral deposits, things like crude oil included. Other things being equal, the more natural resources a country has allows a country to produce more output. In per worker terms, an increase in the natural resources per labor unit causes an increase in output per labor unit. N over L, the more you have N over L, the more you have Y over L. Some countries are rich because they have abundant natural resources. A good example would be Saudi Arabia, which has lots of oil. But countries do not need to have natural resources to necessarily be rich. For example, Japan imports much of the natural resources it needs. It's island nations. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources. Now, technological knowledge. This technolo technological knowledge is society's understanding of the best ways to produce goods and services. Technological progress does not only mean a faster computer or a higher definition TV or a smaller, more sleek cell phone. It means any advance in knowledge that boosts productivity and thus allows society to get more output from its resources. An example, classic example, would be Henry Ford and his development of the assembly line, which allowed him to take capital and labor and be much more productive by assembling cars in an assembly line. He could do more that way. This definition of technology is more broad than what most people think of as technology. To most people, improvements in technology mean a smaller cell phone, a faster computer, a higher definition TV set, an MP3 player that will hold more songs, and so on and so forth. But quote-unquote technology does not just mean computer-related stuff. Technology refers to the knowledge that allows producers to transform inputs into outputs. Here's an important example of, of technological progress that doesn't involve computers at all. Go back to Henry Ford here. Henry Ford discovered that he, can produce, he could boost productivity in his auto factory simply by rearranging the workers and the machines and reassigning workers to the task. Now, some interesting trivia as a side note here. When Henry Ford while Henry Ford is famous for introducing the assembly line in 1913, the, the idea was actually already over, over 100 years old. In 1799, Eli Whitney introduced the assemb assembly line of production and the manufacture of muskets for the U.S. government. Whitney was famous for inventing the cotton gin, but his discovery of the assembly line has had far greater impact on productivity and living standards in the U.S. than even the cotton gin. Small bit of trivia. So let's look at 
te technological knowledge versus human capital. The technological knowledge refers to society's understanding of how to produce goods and services. Human capital results from the effort of people to ex uh, to expend um, to acquire uh, this knowledge. So you, you have to get trained up. You have to get educated before you can make technological knowledge available, or you can make technological advances. Generally, you have to be pretty bright to do something like that. However, both are important to productivity. Now, human capital is generally tied to an ind individuals who expend the effort to acquire it. Uh, for example, if someone discovers the, a more cost-effective way to manufacture cars, this knowledge can be shared with all ma auto manufacturers, causing a general increase in productivity in the auto sector, across the whole industry, really. If someone acquires some skills or experience that enable him or her to do, his jo do their job better, then their productivity rises, and not a, their productivity rises, but not all, not that of all the persons in his occupation. So, it's a very key distinction between the technological advances and human capital. Now, let's take a look at something called the production function. The production function is a graph or equation. It's an equation that can be graphed, showing the relationship between you know, outputs and inputs. Now, Y here is your output, obviously. The F and everything inside the parentheses, F means is a function that shows how many inputs are combined to produce an output. Okay. Now, here we have labor, capital, um, human capital, and then natural resources. So, we put all these things together, and what we output is a, is a, a function of labor, capital, human capital, and natural resources. A in this example is the level of technology. Obviously different countries, different areas have different levels of technology, so that plays into how much you're able to produce. So long story short, what you're able to produce, Y, is dependent on your technology and is a function of labor, capital, human knowledge, and uh, natural resources. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now A here multiplies the function, everything in F in the parentheses. So the improvements in technology increase A and allow more output to produce, to be produced from any given um, combination of inputs. So tech matters. Technology matters and labor capital, human capital, and natural resources matter. So again, here's your production function. The production function has the property of constant returns to sale, or returns to scale, excuse me. The production function has the property of constant returns to scale, which means changing all the inputs by the same percentage causes an output change by that percentage. For example, doubling all the uh, inputs, multiplying each by two, causes an output to double. Increasing all the inputs by 10% Multiplying, thus us saying, um, saying, hey, you're going to produce what you produced before, but increase it by 10%. It's like multiplying each each factor by 1.1 causes an output to increase by 10%. <clears throat> now, I should point out here to you that we're only multiplying the inputs by two. We're not multiplying the techno technology variable by two. Okay, right here, we're going to see we're not multiplying it by 2, we're not increasing it by 10%. That's just something that's set. You have that level of technology, it's, it's pretty constant. Now, if we multiply each unit by 1 divided by L, then the output is multiplied by 1 divided by L. Okay, What we're doing here is, is putting it in per labor unit terms. This equation shows that productivity as expressed as output by uh, out, excuse me output per worker see your output per worker as we talked before your capital per worker your human capital per worker worker and your natural resources per worker now this all depends on the level of technology a it also depends on your physical capital per per worker and your human capital per worker and your natural resources per worker so you could take this production function and express it in any number of ways. Okay, 
we did it here just to show if you double everything here it doubles output if you increase it by 10 percent here it increases output by 10 percent what we're showing here is is in per worker terms not per capita but per worker because not everyone in the population is a worker some are unemployed so you may wonder what the number one is doing inside the function area the f parentheses area now, on the preceding slide, the aggregate production function was written as y equals um, output is, is dependent on technology and a function of labor capital, human capital, and natural resources. We multiplied all the inputs in this example by 1 over L, and because the constant returns a scale, the output is also all, um, multiplied by 1 over L. Thus, we get our resulting equation that you see here, right here. So the first term in the function is LL, which just equals 1, okay? We're doing it in per labor terms. So if we want to put it in per labor terms, L over L is just 1. That's why this 1 is here. It may have snuck in there. Maybe you missed it. Now, um, read literally, this equation says that the output per worker depends on technology, the number of workers per worker, the amount of uh, physical and human capital per worker and the national resources per worker. But the number of workers per worker is always one. That's why this changes to one. So that's L over L. Number of workers per worker is going to be one. If you have 300 workers, you divide it by 300 workers, that's one. So why is A outside of the production function? Okay. Well, what matters for productivity is not the technological knowledge per worker, okay, but simply technological knowledge. Okay? It's not a per worker term. Unlike physical capital and the other resources, technological knowledge can be freely shared among all workers. It's kind of a monkey see, monkey do. If there's a better way of doing something, other workers are going to take notice or other companies are going to take notice and train their workers to do the same thing. So if the number of workers increases, you must purchase new capital for new workers. You need more machines for more workers. Or spread the existing capital more thinly, which affects your per labor unit ratio. But techno technological knowledge can be freely shared with new workers. You just train them. Thus, this A is freestanding. Now... Next, we're going to take a look at the ways public policy can affect long-run growth and productivity and living standards. So we're going to go back to looking at economic growth and public policy. One of the things we need to look at is saving and investment. Now remember, one of the ten principles of economics from Chapter 1 is that people trace fade, uh, blah, face trade-offs. People face trade-offs, don't they? The trade-off between current and future consumption is a good example of one. Now, you can choose to save or you can choose to invest a dollar you make today. Okay, so that's the trade-off between saving and investment. We can boost productivity by increasing capital, which requires investment. That means spending that money on machines and different things that we need to produce. Since resources are scarce, producing more capital requires producing fewer consumer goods. So we're producing things to produce things. We have less things to consume. Reducing consumption is like saying increased saving. So we're redu by re when we reduce consumption, we can increase saving. This extra saving funds the production of investment goods. We'll have more details on this in much more in-depth um, in the next chapter. Hence, there's a trade-off between current and future consumption. Spend a dollar today or save a dollar today. For business, you can spend a dollar today and invest in capital, or you can save a dollar for tomorrow. Now, we also need to consider the diminishing returns in the catch-up effect. The government can implement policies that raise saving and investment. Again, more details in the next chapter. A little foreshadowing there. If we do that, then capital will rise, causing productivity and living standards to rise. But this faster growth is temporary. Reason being, there's diminishing returns to capital. As capital rises, we're putting more, more money into capital. The extra output from additional unit of capital falls. So eventually you get to a point where machines start to have diminishing returns on capital. Okay. 
we get your first machine, you're certainly going to increase productivity. You get your second machine, productivity may increase, but it won't be as much as you did by the, by the first machine. You get a third machine, maybe the factory starts to get a little bit crowded. You are producing more, but your increase from two, from two machines to three machines was not as much as the increase was from zero machines to one machine, and the increase from one machine to two machines was not as much from zero to one. And certainly the increase then from three from two machines to three machines did not get as much as you as you got from zero to one or two to three. So there's a diminishing returns to capital. Now, let's take a look at the production function. Remember how I said you could graph it? And diminishing returns. If workers have little capital, if they have little capital giving them uh, more increases, uh, more increases, uh, if workers have little capital, Giving them more capital increases their productivity a lot. So if you have no machines and you all of a sudden you get machines, then the productivity per unit of labor goes up. If workers already have capital, they already have a lot of capital, giving them more increases productivity fairly little. So if you have a factory that already has machines, let's say 200 machines, you had one more machine, doesn't exactly increase it like it would if you went from no machines to... 301 machines, okay? So this slide le replicates figure one from the text, which illustrates the relationship between productivity, which is output per worker. And one of its determinants is capital per worker. The curve is drawn for given values of other determinants of productivity, like human capital per worker, natural resources per worker, and technology. A change in any of these determinants would shift the curve. The graph is positively sloped, which, mean, which translates that productivity is higher when the average worker has more capital. Right? If you get more machines, you're generally producing more. Um, the graph is curved, reflecting a diminishing returns to capital. Now, this means as a worker, average worker gets more and more capital, productivity rises at a decreasing rate. It's increasing as you get more capital, but it's not increasing as much as the last unit of capital you had. Now, you may find it easier to understand the following statement, especially if it's your first time in economics. If workers don't have very much capital, giving them more will increase their productivity a lot. If workers already have a lot of capital, giving them more won't increase their pr productivity much. It may increase it, but just not as much as if they didn't have capital altogether. Okay? Positively sloped, as you get more capital per worker, your output per worker goes up. Now, it gets to be a point where you just covered up in capital, you get more capital, your productivity is going to start leveling off. Okay. Initially get some capital, boom, big increases. Gets a little more capital, you know, another increase. Then we start to flatten out. What's happening here? We're getting a lot of machines, okay, and it's starting to have diminishing returns. Now, in this graph, we're going to talk about the catch-up effect, the property whereby poor countries tend to grow more rapidly than rich ones. Well, they usually have more room to grow. Okay? Notice that as the capital per unit of labor increases by the same amount in both countries, um, but thanks to diminishing marginal returns, the increase in capital per unit of labor has a bigger effect in the poor country than the rich country. Well, that makes sense because they haven't introduced as many machines, and once they get them, uh, boom, there's a big jump to be made because they had nothing. Now, look at the rich country's growth rate on this curve. Okay, Rich country starts here. They have a lot of capital per labor. So their output by adding more capital, it does increase, but it's not a huge increase. Okay, It's not a rapid growth rate. Now, the poor country's growth rate, you know, we can see it just increases output from, point he from this point here to that point there. Not a huge difference. Okay. Whereas a poor country's growth rate who has no real capital, they start at the bottom, you give them a little bit of capital, okay, say they have just this much capital to start, you give them some more capital, they're going to be far more productive, they're going to have a big increase. Now as they add capital and add capital, their, their return will start to be diminishing as well. So as a result, a poor country enjoys a higher growth rate than a rich country. Now the gap between them, say from here to here, okay, Begins, uh, my apologies, the gap between them from here to here um, shrinks over time. Now, in the literature and the research, this is known as convergence. 
In this principles level book, we will call this catch-up theory. So um, more advanced economics will call it convergence between the two countries. We will call it catch-up effect, a poor country catching up to a rich country. So in order for the catch-up effect to work, it must be true that both countries have the same technology, so they have comparable machines. Okay, even the, the big difference is the poor country doesn't have as many machines. Um, they have the same tech, and uh, thus they have the same production function, so they're on the same line here. If a poor country has inferior technology, its production function will be much lower, um, and then it won't, it won't necessarily grow as fast as the rich one. Uh, the gap won't necessarily shrink over time either. So um, if this is with a rich country's production function, a poor country was couldn't even get um, you know the same type of technology, the same type of capital in there, um, their uh, production function would be much um, much smaller. Now, here's an example of the catch-up effect and and catch-up effect in, in play. Over 1960 to 1990, the U.S. and South Korea devoted a similar share of GDP to investment. So you might expect that they would have a similar growth performance. But growth was greater than 6% in Korea and only 2% in the U.S. The explanation for this difference is the catch-up effect. In 1960, the capital per unit of labor was far smaller in Korea than it was in the U.S. Hence, Korea grew faster. So they had the big jumps in growth, whereas the U.S. already had a lot of capital, didn't have big jumps in growth. Now, another thing that's interesting to consider, especially when we start talking about international agreements, is the investment from abroad. To raise capital per unit of labor, uh, and hence raise productivity, wages, and living standards, the government can also encourage foreign direct investment. A capital investment, for example, a factory that is owned and operated by a foreign entity. You can probably think of one in the upstate of South Carolina, BMW, Michelin, so on and so forth. There can also be foreign portfolio investment. A capital investment uh, financed with foreign money but operated by domestic residents. Okay? So one foreign direct investment is a foreign entity moves into an area and produces things produced by the foreign entity there. Foreign portfolio investment is a capital investment financed, financed with foreign money. So it's basically they, they give a loan to domestic companies to produce. Okay. Some of the returns from these investments flow back to the foreign countries naturally that supplied the funds. This is real big not only in, in, in the U.S., but it's big for countries like, say, a Korea to have foreign direct investment and also foreign portfolio investment. Investment from abroad continued. This especially benefits, uh, it's especially beneficial in poor countries that cannot generate enough saving to fund investment projects themselves, so they get, they get funds from outside, which helps. It also helps poor countries learn state-of-the-art technologies developed in other countries. If a Boeing, Bosch, a BMW one goes into a poorer country and starts uh, training workers and producing goods and services uh, to be sold worldwide in that poorer country, say for lower labor costs, um, that labor quickly picks up on the new technology and that, that is a bit of a positive bug that spreads quite rapidly. People learn how to work their machines. They learn how to do technological manufacturing. And that makes them more attractive for additional investment from abroad. Now, education. You guys know I, I believe in education. Education is important. Now, government can increase productivity by promoting education. They can invest in human capital age. Okay? This is done through public schools and subsidizing loans for college, making it possible for people to acquire new skills and abilities. Now, education has significant effects. In the U.S., each year of schooling raises a worker's wage by 10%, and that's a very low estimate in my experience. But investing in human capital also involves a trade-off between the present and the future. Spending a year in school, as you well know, requires sacrificing a year's wage now to have higher wages 
later. Now, Brazil has Im implemented a policy which gives families cash payments if their children attend school faithfully. Other developing countries have similar policies, which experts predict will raise productivity and living standards in the long run. Now, earlier editions of this very same textbook were on the 7th edition, contained an in-the-news box with an article on this. But if you're interested in seeing more, um, you can Google an article by Cecilia Duggar, D-U-G-G-E-R, not those Duggars, uh, entitled Brazil Pays Parents to Help Poor Peer... Excuse me. Brazil Pays Parents to Help Poor Be Students and Not Wage Earners. That's in the New York Times from 2004. Brazil pays parents to help poor, help the poor be students and not wage earners. It helps them go to school and sacrifice short-run earnings for longer-run, higher wages. Now, health and nutrition is important as well. Health care expenditure is a type of investment in human capitals. Healthier workers are more productive. Duh. If you're at work, you're able to work, you're more productive. In countries with significant malnourishment, raising workers' caloric intake raises productivity. Yeah, imagine that. You feed a worker, they can actually work. From 1962 to 1995, caloric consumption rose by 44% in South Korea, and the economic growth was spectacular. Now, Nobel winner Robert Fogel found that 30% of Great Britain's growth from, or excuse me, from 1790 to 1980 was due to improved nutrition. Healthy, happy workers are more productive workers. Investing in human capital, either through education or improving health and nutrition, can indeed lead to higher incomes in the long run and more productivity. It's equally true that countries with higher incomes can afford to devote more resources to schooling and improved health nutrition. So it's kind of a positive snowball that gets rolling downhill. You just have to get it started. Now, also important to productivity are property rights and political stability. Now, recall that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. The price system allocates resources to their most efficient use, their highest valued use. This requires respect for property rights, the ability for people to exercise authority over the resources they own, to be able to get patents, to be able to hold property, to be able to develop new things. Um, if every idea you ever came up with is just stolen by a corrupt government, you're not really going to be enticed to develop new ideas. So political stability and property rights is very important. In many poor countries, the justice, justice system doesn't work very well. Contracts aren't always enforced. Fraud, corruption often go unpunished. In some, firms must bribe the government, government officials for permits. Now, with political instability, for example, there's, there's frequent coups. Some generals always throwing out some president. This creates uncertainty over whether property rights uh, will be protected in the future. When people fear their capital may be stolen by criminals or confiscated by a corrupt government, there's less investment, including from abroad. I mean, that's just a bad investment to invest in a country that may steal everything from you. And the economy functions less efficiently. Rightfully so. So this results in lower living standards because they're less productive. So economic stability, efficiency, and healthy growth require law enforcement, effective courts, a stable constitution, and honest government officials. Across a large swath of the world, that's much easier said than done. Also important is free trade. Now, you can have inward or outward-oriented policies. Inward-oriented policies include uh, things like tariffs, limits on investment from abroad, and uh, that, you know, an aim to raise living standards by avoiding interaction with other countries, basically closing off your borders and just taking your ball and going home. Okay, uh, Those policies are very inward-oriented. Outward-oriented policies include the elimination of restrictions on trade, so free trade agreements, NAFTA, things like that, or um, not only encouraging foreign investment, but making sure there's no policies that prevent companies from taking on foreign investors. Now, this promotes the integration into a world economy. So one's very free trade and one's very, is not. So inward-oriented policies are not very free trade, and outward-oriented policies are free trade. 
So now let's recall, trade can make everyone better off. It's one of our 10 principles of economics. Trade has similar effects as discovering new technologies. It improves productivity and living standards. If you, if you see things being produced in your country that had been produced in other areas, you learn things very quickly. Now, countries with inward-oriented policies have generally failed to create growth. An example would be Argentina through, uh, throughout the 20th century. Countries with outward-oriented policies have often succeeded. People who are willing to uh, bring in outside experts and bring in outside companies like South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan after 1960 all saw incredible growth after the 1960s. Now, also important is research and development. Technological progress is the main reason why living standards rise over the long run. One reason is, the knowledge, is that knowledge is a public good. Ideas can be shared freely, and they're increasing, which increase the productivity of many. So once you learn how to do something well, you can share it, and a lot of people can do it. Thus, you're more productive. Now, policies to promote uh, technological progress include patent laws, give people rights to come up with great ideas, and they can retain those rights. Providing tax incentives or direct support like subsidies for private sector research and development. We've seen a lot of that in the medical field. And grants for basic research at univers universities. So a research university gets a grant to study a new cancer pill or gets a grant to study a new way to clean um, unpotable water. Uh, they find ways to clean unpotable water. Perhaps it goes to a third world country. All of a sudden, people have clean water. They don't spend all day looking how to get clean water. They figure out a way to get food, and then they're very, they're much more productive than they were when they were just wandering around looking for clean water. So grants to ba for basic research at universities uh, could fund things like that. That could, in turn, increase productivity. Now, an important thing to keep an eye on is population growth, which may affect living standards in three different ways. The first one is a stretching of the natural resources. Now, 200 years ago, a guy named Malthus argued that population growth would strain society's ability to provide for itself. Malth Malthus. Malthusian, he became known as. Since then, however, the world population has increased sixfold. If Malthus was right, living standards would have fallen, we'd run out of food, and, but instead they've risen. Malthus, what he failed to account for was, were uh, technological progress and productivity of growth. Uh, things like his big concern was, we're not going to have enough grain to feed all these people if our population explodes. What he didn't account for were advances in agriculture that allowed us to increase yields of grain being produced. So we were able to produce more food at a rapid rate. So people weren't starving, we just figured out how to feed them with our scarce resources, so we gained efficiencies. The same can be said today about many technologies and how we are developing them. The second um, effect on living standards with population growth is diluting the capital stock. A bigger population means there's a higher labor pool, and thus... You're dividing capital by, more, capital by more labor, so it's a lower capital per unit of labor, which can equal lower productivity and living standards. Now, this applies to how human capital is, as well as this applies to human capital as well as physical capital. A fast population growth equals more children and a greater strain on the educational system. We've all seen a school that's busting at the seams; it's hard to train anybody. Now, countries with fast population growth tend to have a lower educational attainment. Perhaps the diluting of the capital stock is to blame there. Now, population is also important, or excuse me, continue on with diluting the capital stock. To combat this, many developing countries use a policy to control population growth. Um, this is really one of the reasons why China, China says one child per family. Okay, There's ways around it, but that is a rule in China. Uh, there's also contraception, education, and availability made by a government who wants to limit the population. And then um, uh, taking steps to promote female literacy to raise the opportunity cost of having babies. So um, if you educate your population, perhaps, and, and, and then you tell them the reasons why you don't want them to have more babies, or if you just educate them to where they can read a prophylactic wrapper, 
Uh, if they couldn't read before, now they understand how not to get pregnant. Those types of things can help with diluting the capital stock. Sounds kind of messed up, but it happens. Now, the third thing we need to look at with population growth here is promoting technological progress. Now, this is a real cool thing to do. There's more people, right? But there's if you have more people, you have the potential for more scientists. You have the potential for more inventors. You have the potential for more engineers. You have the potential for more frequent discoveries when you have all these smart people. Okay, You have to make them smart to start. And then you have faster technological progress and economic growth. I think that's one of the things that Malthus missed in the first point. So evidence from Michael Kramer. Um, over the course of human history... Um, the growth rate in growth rates increase as the world's population increase, and more populated regions grew faster than less populated ones. So it can be done. You can have growth in technology um, in areas where there's a lot more people because sharing of ideas becomes much more contagious. There's more research. Um, there's more resources for education. There's m more of everything you need to make technological progress. Now, uh, Kramer's, uh, Kramer, I should say, I think is how he says it. Uh, this research was per, per, uh, published in the early 1990s, I think 1993, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Now, are natural resources a limit, of growth, limit to growth? Some argue that population growth is depleting the Earth's non-renewable resources and thus will limit uh, the growth in living standards. But technolo technological progress often yields ways to avoid these limits. For example, hybrid cars use less gas, so we burn less crude oil, or we consume less crude oil. Better insulation in homes reduces the energy required to heat and cool them. So every advance you have in technology in that, we use less resources and natural resources. As a resource becomes more scarce, its market price rises, which increases the incentive to conserve it and develop alternatives to try to replace it with something that doesn't cost so much. Now, in a market economy, scarcity is reflected in market prices. If the world were running out of natural resources, the price of those resources would be rising over time. They become more scarce. But in fact, they are not. The prices of most natural resources in real terms today are stable or falling. It appears that our ability to conserve these resources is growing much more rapidly than the supplies are dwindling. So we're getting better at using what, um, what little bit we have more efficiently. Now, in conclusion... In the long run, living standards are determined by productivity. Policies that affect the determinants of productivity will therefore affect the next generation's living standards. One of these determinants is saving and investment. In the next chapter, as foreshadowed before, we will learn how saving and investment are determined and how policies can affect them. Now, This, is, this slide alludes to the chapter entitled Saving, Investment, and the Financial System, which will be uh, started immediately after the current chapter. Now, in summary, there are great differences across countries in living standards and growth rates. Productivity, otherwise known as output per unit of labor, is the main determinant of living standards in the long run. Productivity depends on fiscal and human um, capital per worker, natural resources per worker, and technological knowledge. Growth in these factors, especially technological progress, a causes growth in living standards over the long run. Policies can affect uh, the, f uh, the following, each of which has an important effect on growth. Saving and investment, international trade, education, health and nutrition, property rights and political stability, research and development, and population growth. Because of diminishing returns to capital, growth from investment eventually slows down and poor countries may quote-unquote catch up to rich ones. Interesting chapter. Very interesting chapter. Okay, This concludes the chapter, uh, the video lecture on production and growth. Please let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to send me a message or stop by during office hours. Thank you.